Let's do it. All right, well, uh, thank you all again for joining us for Closing Bell. Um, I think we'll have a really interesting discussion today, um, but before I get it as, uh, before I forget, as a reminder, um, if you've got questions uh, for Trey and I, or our guest who is much smarter than Trey and I combined, um, you can um, give us those uh, by typing them into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen here, uh, and we will address them uh, as we're going on. So, Trey, won't you get us started, man? Yeah, well, um, in exciting news in my life, I've moved out to the country, so my internet is uh, naturally terrible, and uh, I only yesterday got power back into my house. So we're, we're batting a 1,000 out here in Mason, Michigan right now. Did you have your emo haircut last week, or is that that's uh, new for this no, week? No, no, and I got an emo haircut, um, so I, <laughs> I said that I'm, I'm back to mosh pitting at saliva and yellow card concerts. Um, so <laughs> I think only like three people will know who that is. <laughs> I, uh, I cut my own hair. Uh, so, and for as much as people say it's easy, it is really not easy. Uh, so it, it's not great. Well, it but, looks really good, man. Uh, yeah. Well, on camera. I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot going on at least in my life, but, but obviously not nearly like what else is going on in the world. Um, so since last week, or since, I don't know, the beginning of this, I thought it was important to show out of the gate that um, America's beef crisis is over, at least for now, is at least the way that Bloomberg is talking about it. Um, so the reason they bring up Wendy's is because uh, for a while there, you know, Wendy's is really famous for having their fresh, never frozen beef patties. Um and uh, there were certain shortages in certain supply chains in, in uh, the, the Wendy's supply chains, especially. Um, and so Wendy's has meat again. Uh, so the, the world is healing one square patty at a time. Um, and uh, at the same time, you've seen- That was a great kind of, quote, dude. Well, you yeah, need to world, say that more often. You're right. One square patty at a time. <laughs> Everything is coming back to normal. Healing, one square patty at a time. Um, so, you know, we had this massive spike in prices uh, in May for, uh, for uh, this is U.S. choice grade uh, beef at the wholesale level. Huge spike, uh, but now we're seeing it come back down to where we might expect it to be um, in years past. So, um, you know, this is, this is comforting. You know, you're not going to see this, I think, reported as much because it's not as scary. It's just more realistic. Um, and, uh, but at least as of right now, it looks like things are, are coming to, I don't know, some type of historic pattern as opposed to this kind of uh, novel moment in, in agriculture. Okay, so another interesting fact that I think uh, is worth throwing out, this comes from the, uh, the most recent CPI numbers. Uh, so this is wheat bed bread prices. Uh, so people say that it's because of Americans baking their own. Uh, you know, we could kind of speculate blindly as to why this has happened, but but just notice that there was kind of a slight blip or a slight drop in uh, in wheat bread prices um, over the last uh, month. Um, so that's you know, people I know, I know Schaefer's uh, partner is making incredible bread. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, for my birthday, I was awarded some of this uh, incredible white bread. So I know a lot of people were doing that. Um, so, so this is, again, uh, probably something that maybe people might have expected, but it's interesting to see it in the data now. Yeah, I mean, we've already talked about that. I, I think that that's the wrong story, the fact that it's the, the baking their own bread issue. But, right. but uh, I think there's enough. a drop in demand just because people aren't going to the grocery store as yeah, much. Exactly. And people, people tend or to buy restaurants. Bread. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So what, what is interesting, I think, to point out in this is so wheat bread prices or white bread prices have come down a little bit. But now look at the, 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 the shift that you've seen or the, the gap that's starting to kind of unveil itself between wheat and corn prices in the United States. Um, so, so I'm saying that the bread, which obviously is made from wheat, has, uh, has come down at some level in price. But look at at, at least the relative stability of wheat prices or, or even the increase of wheat prices over time relative to corn, which has fallen off. Now, what is especially interesting is those two things tend to track each other fairly well in history. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, this was the chart of note for this morning from uh, the USDA. I, 
you know, I, I could, again, speculate blindly, but Schaefer, what, what is your blind speculation as to this gap in prices? <laughs> well, I just wish that the sucker went, went back a little bit longer. I think, yeah. uh, well, so obviously ethanol, right? Ethanol is a big story here. The fact that we were driving less corn is a major, uh, or ethanol is a major um, demand for, for corn. Um, we're not doing uh, corn, we're not doing ethanol as much anymore, or weren't for a while. I do think one thing that's different here is just to highlight between your last slide and this slide, this is hard red winter wheat versus the last one was white bread. Uh, and so the fact that those stories don't track exactly, I think is consistent with the fact that they're substitutable, but not, they're not the exact same product. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but I, I do think that it is interesting to, to at least see this, this space that's, uh, that's kind of opening itself up over time. Um, that, that, I mean, it again, doesn't track perfectly with COVID, but you can see there in March, um, that, that gap kind of expanded pretty rapidly and has stayed fairly stable. Um, I would say so interesting data. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to kind of watch how this all plays out. Um, another story that we have talked about to death, but I think it's really fascinating to see it in data is the change of consumption of food away from home, uh, substituting from f or to food at home. So this is the percent change uh, year over year. So this is relative to uh, the same month in the prior year, so 2019 versus 2020, how much more we've eaten at home versus how much we've eaten uh, away from home. So if you'll notice, um, food at home increased year over year, uh, I think it was about 19, 20% is what the, the number is. Um, now, that's impressive, I suppose, if you want to think about it. But notice that the massive shift that happened in restaurants. So, so the, the, they don't match, right? Like, I mean, it, people are eating, but, but they're even eating in a different way um, in, in terms of the total dollar, dollar expenditures that they're, uh, that they're consuming. Um, and we what's even more here? interesting to me is if you look at the recession, so the, 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 the shaded area. So look at how both dropped during the recession. That does not look the same as of right now in, uh, in the food away from home, food at home data um, within the pandemic space. Uh, but just quickly though, I think your comment that the shift hasn't been equivalent is something, maybe true, I'm not sure, but it's not something we can see with this picture. Uh, just because of I mean, the one's fact. a 50% drop and one's a 20% increase. Mm -hmm. um, but the I mean I guess what you need to levels, have is total dollar expenditures exactly, and you need to exactly. look at the percent like not to the, just the percent change but um, exactly yeah just just yeah. to make the point that I'm not sure that that story is true once you get well, to the to the the heart of what we're talking about today okay so the heart of what we're talking about is uh, is something that you know the, the rest of those stories are, are uh, I think we've covered ad nauseum at this point um, but again, um, for the second week in a row, um, we feel that it's, it's very important to kind of take a step back and look at, at what's, what's really driving the conversation right now. And, and that very clearly is uh, issues within racial inequality, racial inequities, um, and, uh, you know, political and institutional issues associated within racism. So last week, we tried to talk about from uh, kind of a personal perspective, uh, with my, uh, my brother-in-law about his experiences. Uh, today, uh, we actually are super fortunate to be able to have Quentin Tyler with us. So Quentin Tyler has been here at Michigan State for a couple years now. He's the Associate Dean and Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at uh, Canner at Michigan State. Um, so this is uh, actually really exciting for me. I, we, we've, uh, we've been able to talk a little bit, but you know, this is, uh, I don't know, this is unique. This is something that I, I at least personally, haven't thought enough about. Um, so, so Quentin, thanks for joining us. We're uh, really looking forward to talking to you today. Yeah, Alex, I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity provided by you and Trey. Uh, I think this is going to be a really robust conversation. Uh, but I do have a couple of slides that I'll share with the audience uh, to provide some context of some things I'm going to talk about. But uh, if we could just kind of start a little bit about the slides. So, you know, it's not often that I get to say I get to talk about racism and ag. You know, more so, uh, you know, as you, as you talked about my role, you know, I talk about ways to promote a diverse and equitable and inclusive culture today. But I'm, I'm excited to talk about this opportunity to engage in dialogue about an industry that's played an important role in my life. 
in so many people's lives across Michigan and, and the United States. So again, you know, uh, I just want to provide some context to this conversation. You know, uh, I've been in this role for two years, but prior to this role, I was actually uh, the assistant dean in the College of Ag, Food and Environment at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, I, was in, I worked in a diversity space for over 15 years. And then uh, Alex and Trey, you probably didn't know this about me, but I've worked in the area as ag educator at Kentucky uh, mm -hmm. in extension. And then also farm analysis, I've worked in that space too. And then also with the United States Department of Ag, uh, as an econo in the ERS, Economic Research Service, mm -hmm. John Durlesco, and also risk analysis, you know, in ConAgra Foods. And again, all that shows my love and passion. Jeez, Louise, how old are you? Agriculture. <laughs> well, I got a pretty diverse uh, experience to speak of as we talk about systemic racism in ag. If you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned, you know, uh, again, being from Kentucky, but I do want to provide the foundation on what this conversation is going to come from. So again, uh, you know, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, as you can see, is uh, on the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, and also it's located in the county of Christian County, Kentucky, which is an agricultural community. It's not only one of the leading agricultural regions in Kentucky, but it also has a place in history. So Trey and Alex, you all may not know this, but the late Harry Young is credited with planting the first field of no-till corn on a commercial farm in the United States that happened in my county in Kentucky. <laughs> And also today, most of the, the county's grain crops are raised using no-till methods that the young individual helped pioneer. And interesting enough that uh, actually I was uh, the first African-American graduate of our Kentucky Ag Leadership Program. Wow. And was program with Al Young, which is uh, the grandson of, uh, of Harry Young. And again, to provide some additional context, you know, Burley and Darkfield fired tobacco account for one third of the total revenue in this area. And this region along with Western Tennessee produces almost all of the world's dark fire tobacco, which is processed and chewing products. So again, Kentucky is a huge agriculture community and uh, the foundation of which this conversation is gonna be laid. So again, as I talk about, you know, my experiences in the ag field, I actually did not grow up on a farm, but I do remember quite frankly, you know, growing up in Hawkinsville, Kentucky and many of my peers not starting school till after Labor Day because they were busy working and cutting tobacco. And that was an opportunity for folks to have school clothes. And I remember that, you know, and wondering and looking around and saying, hey, where are my colleagues? Where are my, my peers at, right? And it was the fact that those folks were cutting tobacco, if I can recall, between eight and 10 cents a stick and, and finding money, you know, for school clothes during that important period. And to me, it's a lot about the value between, you know, work and the value of education. If we can go to the next slide. So again, I just want to provide some additional context to the, to the to farmers in Christian County, Kentucky. As you can see, you know, again, uh, there's over uh, almost 1,800 farms in the county with 36 of those being black and African-American. If you look at the Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Latinx origin of farms, there's five of those in the county. That is a huge disparity. Um, I mean, what, it, sorry, what are you gonna say? Jeff? No, I just wanted to know what the population uh, demographics were relative to these farm demographics? So from a historical standpoint, if you look at it, Hawkinsville itself within the city is 28,000 now, but the county has 71,000. But also, if you think about it from the historical significance and importance of uh, farming, 33% of the population in, in Hawkinsville or Christian County is African-American. 33%, okay. 33%, that's one of the highest what? percentages in the state of Kentucky. So 33% of the county is African American, but only 36 farms in the county are owned by African American farmers. Correct. Am I understand that? Well, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. What you going to say? Well, no, I mean, I guess you, I, you, you kind of think about that number and you say, well, maybe that's just unique in that county, right? But, but I mean, as we've talked about, it seems like it's not really the case, right? Right. And, and, and Trey, I'm glad that you spoke to that because if you think about the next slide that we have here, this talks about U.S. agriculture and race. So in general, agriculture is 96% white in the racial makeup of farmers, according to the USDA Census of, of Agriculture. But only 32,000 farmers out of 2 million identify as African American. And today, if you put that in percentage-wise, according, well, according to 2012, that's 1.5%. But also, if you look at it, in 1910, almost a century ago, there were 925,000 uh, 
forums that was classified as Black or African American, which is 14%. And if you look at the current numbers today in the Latinx community, it's 6%. So all those are uh, interesting factors to think about as you think about the decline or the land loss in terms of African American farmers. So, okay, so let me, let me ask some questions about this. So, I mean, from, a, from just an ag perspective, you've seen this kind of consolidation and uh, shrinking of the number of farms total. Um, from kind of an institutional perspective, um, these numbers suggest that, that not only were farms in general shrinking, but African-American farms numbers were shrinking even faster, right? Um, so you mentioned here that like, so Latinx farms are at a 6% in, in uh, 2000 or in 1910. Um, relative to other racial groups, um, do, do these trends line up similarly? Um, or, or do you know? So like, what about Asian farmers? Um, you know, what, what about Latinx farmers? Like, is, is the trend line about the same? Or what's what's the differences? I would say the same, you know, yeah. Since again, as you think about it, you know, and, and not discounting any other groups, but the massive agricultural system, particularly in the South, was built on the blacks of enslaved people from Africa and their children. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you think about it from the Native American perspective, they were often uh, removed from their homelands, which was further petitioned by federal laws. So all these things come into factor as you talk about systemic racism in agriculture. So, can I can I ask one just just. Uh maybe it's a nitpicky point. Trey always gives me a hard time about being nitpicky about this stuff, but I'm just wondering what our definition here is of farmers. If this is uh, the owners of the land, what are these percentages we're looking at? Is that the landowners or the owner operators or the um, tenant farmers? You don't have to know. I'm just curious. Yeah. So uh, what figure are you, re are you referring to? um say the the um census of ag yeah let's see so those are actually the owners the landowners themselves yeah, yeah okay land owners. okay because i can imagine yeah i can imagine that the it is less disparate in the tenant farmer operations and at the same time that's kind of part of the problem, right? Right. So there was actually a really interesting choices article that was published uh, a few months ago about how um, the census of ag has changed the way that they, uh, they measure farms. Um, and so there in the 2012 census, there was actually um, a fair number of articles that came out that said like uh, minority and female owned farms have increased significantly relative to the prior census. Um, and you know, it's the problem is that it's unclear whether or not that's true because the measurement itself has changed. So, so I would actually almost guess that that this 2012 data um, is is probably even overestimating relative to the prior data in in uh, 19, 1910 would be my good guess. Good point. Very good point. Um, which again is is fascinating. I, I mean, growing up in Kansas, you don't really think about this, <laughs> um, and uh, and so. You know, kind of seeing the numbers laid out like this is uh, it's it's especially unique. And and honestly, you know, when I think about Kentucky, um, you know, I think about a, a racial melting pot. You know, uh, and and so you know, even in a county that that clearly is a, a racial melting pot, it, it it sounds like it just does not translate to the ag community. Um, do you have any thoughts on why that is? Well, I think you know uh, the historical trauma associated with agriculture, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, uh, I was recently reading an article and it said that trauma is inherited. So over the years, you know, if you have this negative perception or perspective of what agriculture is, you know, you're not going to go into the field. And then also it's associated with uh, hard labor, right? So if you think about it, there's several articles out there that talked about, you know, uh, the pay associated with it. And then also uh, I mentioned the, the eight to 10 cent sticks that, uh, you know, many, many of my, my teenage uh, counterparts were making, right? So to me, you know, uh, even in thinking about my own situation, you know, uh, Trey and Alex, is that when I decided to to tell my family members that I was going to major in ag economics, you know, I had to fight them off and saying, "Hey, we didn't, we didn't, hmm. we didn't uh, support you to go to college to do that." Really? Yeah. How because of the ag piece. Just the ag piece. 
I mean, just the natural perception of what they see, what they hear. And then also just kind of give me a little bit of background. My mother grew up in Alabama, you know, so, you know, so farming from that perspective as well. So, you know, they said, hey, you know, we want you to be something, a major that we heard about, right? Maybe an engineer or, you know, a, a doctor or an attorney, you know, so. So we're still fighting that stigma. And then also, if you think about it from an imagery standpoint, you know, if you put, if you do a Google search, you put farmer in, you know, what are you going to see? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, this, I, I was sorry, I was going to throw up this too. Um, I mean, from an imagery perspective, from this cultural norms perspective, I, I think there are all these questions about, like, how do you, how do you even shift these cultural norms? And I, I think, you know, that's why it's, it's really cool that, that your office exists here in Michigan State, because it's, you know, it's got to start, it's got to start at the education level, right? Right. Um, but, but, I mean, you, you've pointed out in conversations before that there, it's not just a cultural problem, there are policy and institutional problems too, right? Correct. Well, so before we jump into these, because I think this is going to be a dense conversation, I just want to ask uh, a bit more about the, the tr historical trauma aspect of this thing. So, hmm. so you, you've presented these figures uh, that say there has been a huge exit of farm ownership uh, among blacks relative to whites. Um, and, and you will talk about some of the kind of policy led things that have led to that. I, I, I'm just curious on your own perspective of if there is this um, historical trauma associated with that, could you argue that that's okay? That, that if, if people don't wanna be associated with agriculture because of the fact that we've got this baggage of slavery uh, is, how do we, is that okay, I guess? Uh, you know, I think it's according to the individual. You know, I think it's all about, to me, that's, that's the importance of uh, having choices, right? But to me, I think, you know, if we do have this negative perception or, or initial thoughts, uh, negative thoughts about agriculture, we're missing out on huge opportunities. Hmm. You know, and myself included, you know, I think, uh, you know, in traveling up, you know, and going to the University of Kentucky and majoring in agriculture economics, agriculture economics wasn't my initial choice. As it, as it, and it was because it wasn't preached to me in the high school, middle school realm. There was ag education yeah. programs, there were national organizations that was a part of that. I actually was a part of 4-H youth development as well. As time went on, I never thought that was a career avenue that I had until I had a, a former farmer, well, a farmer actually explained to me, hey, you might want to go into this. And this was a, one of those minority or African-American farmers in Christian County. Can I ask one? Well, so we've got a question here. And then can I ask one more, one more question about that? Um, and I think they're both related, my question and the question we've got. So my question is, um, you've talked about the historical um, trauma and the fact that, that at least among owners, um, blacks are now less represented. Is that equivalently true when we think about farm laborers? Uh, are, are blacks now less represented among farm laborers than they historically were? You don't have to know the answer if you don't know the answer. Uh, and then someone uh, named Closing Bell uh, on the Q&A has asked if we could give the age distribution. Uh, so we, we've talked before on this program about how the median age of farmers in the U.S. is about 300 years old. And so I just wonder what your uh, understanding is about that age distribution for white versus black versus uh, other minorities in the farm community. That was like 900 questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, so Alex, I can just speak to, you know, my interactions and experiences. The majority of the African-American farmers I know are older. You know, but that doesn't, to me, I, I think we still have a lot of folks that are interested in getting to the field, but there's a lot of barriers to entry as well, so. So on, uh, to, to the, the question though, just, just I, I was just gonna point this out anyways. Um, this piece in Ag and Human Values, um, so racial, ethnic, and gender inequality or inequities in, in farm ownership, um, is uh, it's, it basically breaks down all of those questions that you're asking about the kind of the census data on, on uh, farms relative to, uh, you know, these different inequities. Um, if you don't have a university account, I'm happy to, um, to just send you a PDF of the paper. Um, the middle but, one right here, right? The, yeah, the, yeah, the ag and human values one, it's, it's an, it's a peer reviewed article in, uh, kind of the top rural sociology journal. 
Um, but it's, yeah, we're, we're not there yet, but I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so, but, but that does raise a question then. Um, so when I was thinking about agriculture, um, you know, part of the question that everybody always asks is, well, do you have a farm background? Uh, you know, like, like, did your parents farm? Did your grandparents farm? Uh, you know, how much farming did you do when you were a kid is like a thing that people always kind of lean into. Um, it, it sounds to me, and, and maybe I'm wrong, were your parents, your parents weren't connected to agriculture, right, Quentin? Uh, not at all. You know, I mentioned that as a, as, a, as a child, you know, my mother worked on the farm. Uh, yeah. Also, we had, you know, gardens and things of that nature, you know, at, at the house. Uh, and you know they were they were, were aware of the importance of agriculture, but never as a as a field of study. So, but I mean that's that intergenerational part of this seems like it. I mean, from the beginning would be difficult. I, I mean, it was. I'm a a white cisgender male, and like I mean that that was a thing that people ask me all the time. So I, I have a hard time, you know. Like I, fortunately, you know, my grandparents farmed, so I could at least say that. Um, like it's it would be difficult to to say oh hey you know th there is this group of people who we we would love to get into farming but like they've never even been on a farm um you know how how, how do you how would we even make that transition and and it's not just for minority groups it's it's for people who are interested in farming but grew up in the city or people who are interested in farming but have never owned land or people in the city in the um, you know, in, in suburban communities who drove by a, a grain elevator one time and have no idea what they're looking at. So Trey, to me, I think it's important, the importance of why we have youth organizations and also having, uh, you know, the importance of agriculture in our curriculum. Uh, I think also is to have advocates at every level. So to me, I think like the people that really introduced to me to where my food came from were folks that didn't look like me. Hmm. There were folks, uh, and also, you know, when I thought about how I really got involved in extension, how I really got involved, you know, uh, continuing my education, those are all folks that who didn't look like me. So that's why I talk about the importance of having advocates, the importance of having allies, and the importance of having this conversation. And even as the only African American uh, that was in uh, the Kentucky Ag Leadership Program, everywhere I went, you know, uh, people were engaging me, people were talking to me about, you know, their respective areas, their, 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 uh, their, their, uh, how they came about through farming and was always interested in my story as well. You know, and that's what I always say, you know, and I preached this, you know, before I came into this role, I actually had a role of recruiting folks and as extension agents, also recruiting students into the ag space. So to me, it was always telling my story because people always want to know my story. I think, I think part of, uh, so I, I think part of Trey's question is like a perfect alley-oop into the slide we've got right here, which is the, the fact that the the age-old question that we're facing even as these white guys is um, why are you doing ag stuff if your if your family weren't doing ag stuff right and so I wonder Quentin if you can give us an overview of how um, US policy the system has favored consistently um, white landowners, white farmers, relative to um, black farmers and, and other minorities? So yeah, so, you know, as we talk about instances uh, and we talk about the important topic of systemic racism and ag, uh, again, these are examples right here, as you can see, of uh, discrimination. So as you can see right here uh, with the USDA in Pickford, so, uh, Pickford, alongside 400 or so African American farmers, filed a class action lawsuit against the USA, USDA, which alleged that from 1981 to 1997, USDA officials ignored complaints brought to them by black farmers and that they were denied loans of support as, re as a result of that. And they actually ended up uh, settling on that case and providing, I think it was, the amount was around 50000 to each of the farmers. Mm. Uh, and then next you have what we call uh, the California Alien Land Law of 1913, which prohibited many different people of color from owning land. So I thought that was very interesting. So again, uh, and then next you have what we, the important topic that's going on right now is heirs' property. 
So 60% of African American farmers operate on land that's been passed through generations without a will or succession plan. And heirs' property actually deals with, uh, it's a legal term that land is owned by two or more people, usually people from common ancestry, who has died without leaving a will. Mm. It's the leading cause of black involuntary land laws. And these landowners do not qualify for certain USDA loans to purchase livestock or cover the cost of planting. And last but certainly not least, another example that I have is homestead laws. So a scholar, Carrie Lee Merritt, a historian and independent scholar, calls this the most extensive, radical, redistributive, redistributive government policy in U.S. history. And the National Park Service estimates that about 93 million more of the U.S. population are descendants of people who received land through homestead acts. And the number likely includes a number of today's white farmers and landowners. So these are examples of uh, what we term systemic racism in agriculture. Yeah, and so one thing that I think is interesting is when you look at that Homestead, Homestead Act, of those 93 million, definitely both Trey and I uh, are included in that number. It's just crazy to see. So, so the, um, I don't know if you're planning to talk about this later, but the post-Civil War era, uh, if you could talk about the fact that, that um, in terms of land ownership, uh, things were things were improving for for black americans right in the in the aftermath there until 1910 uh, at the same time we had these things that are subsidizing land ownership for for white farmers for white settlers that weren't available to to black farmers including these homestead acts and then we've even since then uh, we've had all these initial or, or additional things that have uh, helped white farmers at the expense of black farmers. Just really interesting. Yeah. So Alex and Trey, uh, there's a couple of terms as we throw around, you know, uh, I don't know one of the slides that I have on there kind of speaks to this. If you have it. That's kind of want to go over a couple of the definitions for folks. So, you know, again, we throw around these terms, racism, racist, and these are terms that, you know, people need to know what they, what they truly mean. So again, when we talk about prejudice, prejudice is a prejudgment about a person based on a social group, right? Then you talk about discrimination being an action based on that prejudice and racism when racial groups collectively uh, prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control. And that's important because, you know, racism is uh, supported and backed by power and an authority. And then, so that's how we get to the whole idea of systemic racism. So systemic racism is highly adaptive. Uh, it's a system that's not this, that favors groups, uh, favors the majority. And then also it's a system that ensures inequalities amongst racial groups. And it's a system that is not named, it, it has, it continues to get powerful. It continues to have power. So again, uh, you know, there's individual acts of racism, but what we're talking about today is systemic racism at the systems level and our policies and procedures and way how we do things. So, okay, so one of my favorite books I've read in the last three years is, is a book called The Color of Law that I've already talked about before, but the, the, the book talks about the uh, institutional barriers to home ownership specifically and uh, in urban areas for African Americans over the 20th century. Um, and so they like in similar to, to many um, stories about people of color, um, I think in the, the media, in conversations, we want to say, well, look at how bad they were in the 19th century. Right. Um, they want to say, well, you know, we the the in this you know, in um, the, the massacres of the Native Americans, um, you know, the Homestead Acts, we stole the land back in, you know, 1893 or whatever the year was in Oklahoma. Um, and, and, you know, I think the same conversation is had um, about the, the 19th century, but, but what is really shocking to me is, is how many of these systemic problems there were that occurred throughout the 20th century, right? Like you, you said the 1980s. Right. I mean, in, in, you know, access to loans is something that without access, having good access to loans, it's almost impossible to be a farmer post 1985. Um, and, and so, you know, if that's if that's a big issue, um, you know, and if there are these institutional constraints, even from the USDA that prevent people from having uh, access to, to farm loans, it's, it's hard for me to understand how we would expect this outcome to be any different, um, which which is incredible. Um, you know, that, that it matters what happened 100 years ago, but it also matters what happened 20 years ago 
It matters what happened 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, and and I, I don't know if, I guess I'm ranting, but, but this is something that, that really has been stuck in my head lately that, um, that we want to tell these old school stories about, you know, the, the Tulsa massacre and, and, and how like, well, you know, look at how bad this was a hundred years ago, but, but it, it's still here. Right. And, and if it's still here, then how do we, what, what are the steps that we have to take to, to move forward? Trey, I think that's a great point, you know, and uh, I want to dedicate a lot of time to talk about solutions, right, or possible suggestions. I do want to have a question I have for both of you all. So talk about, you know, folks getting into, you know, your respective areas, whether it be agriculture, economics, ag education, or any of those fields. You know, when was the, uh, at what age did you all have an African-American teacher or a a teacher of color? In those fields. Right. Yeah. Let's, I'm still waiting. Forever. I agree completely. I, I actually don't know if I've ever had an African-American teacher, yeah. um, and, which is, I, I was thinking about this last week. Um, I, it's, it's a weird, surreal thought um, that, that I, I, and you know, I, I did grow up in a rural place where there just really weren't that many African-Americans, period. Um, but, you know, even like I lived in Kansas City. Um, you know, and, and so I went to college in Kansas City, and I, I, I cannot think of an African American professor um, in my econ program. And, and that actually speaks to something that I've, I've got <laughs> later, which is uh, maybe too much of a slight. But uh, um, there is a lot of work that's being done right now about kind of the history of, of racism in economics. Uh, so eugenics was uh, found itself quite at home in uh, 20th century economic thought. I believe um, so that, yeah. The the photograph here is uh, Sir Francis Galton. Um, Sir Francis Galton, basically the guy that invented regressions, and he invented regressions to be a racist. Uh, so, um, <laughs> the, I mean, this is this is something that is so deeply ingrained in the history of economics, and and I think we see it to this day. I, you know, we we talk a lot about ACTs and SAT testing and standardized testing and IQ testing and everything else that's been used or weaponized, really, um, at, at some level. Um, to, to prevent or to create some type of racial hierarchy. They were created by the statisticians and economists back in the early 20th century. Um, and, and so again, even in economics, like we, we have these systemic problems throughout our fields that like, I, I guess I've never thought about it that much until only recently. Uh, but it, but it's, it's jarring when you realize what system you came from. At the... I don't, I mean, Quentin, you can interrupt me at any time because you know more about this stuff than me. But at the same time, I feel like the, these, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but like really intentional um, evils like this eugenics talk is kind of the least of our worries just because it is this loud and so insidious stuff that it's easily, it's easy to get angry about where the things like the heirs property, uh, which is from my understanding, well, I do know that it applies equally among blacks and whites. uh, And I don't believe that it was a law that was created to intentionally discriminate against uh, black farmers, black landowners. uh, And yet at the same time, it has these effects regardless of the intention. Uh, and because the effects negatively um, impact the people who are the minority, um, there's no incentive by the lawmakers to fix those issues. Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, I asked you the question about when you first had, you know, uh, a teacher of color, particularly in the field, because representation does matter. You know, and I think about, you know, how do we get more folks in the field? How do we get folks? So once we get more folks in the field, we got more folks to be able to support folks that look like them or most open, more open to talking to folks and supporting folks that look like them. But also, too, you know, as I think about my own personal situation, you know, my freshman year, my teacher, my ag uh, economics teacher was my first African-American teacher in a general issues and ag course. Mm-hmm. I recall back on that situation, you know, there were several times, you know, being uh, one of the few in the classes in, in, the, in the course. You know, uh, I, I never liked, you know, talking in front of the class, but he would always call on me, <laughs> you know, and, you know, you always had that one teacher. And I think about him in general, because not after that, he would say, Tyler, you need to come to my office. So even when I came to my office, he was talking to me about opportunities, talking to me about extension, 
I saw that, right? And even to the point where I got to work as an extension agent in my home county in ag and seeing, I never saw ag the way I saw it when I came back to work after, after spending a year at college. And to me, that's what motivated me to get other people into the field. So to me, and then also I think too, not only was he the only individual, but there were, again, I talked about other faculty members who didn't look like me that were, were supportive as well. So that's why I say you ask what can be done in your respective roles as ag economists, as faculty members, you know, to create that environment where people can be, uh, feel safe, uh, feel a sense of belonging, and also receive that mentorship. I think that's important when you have graduate students, when you have undergraduate students, and you're talking about, you know, in terms of the curriculum too. How many people are talking about George Washington Carver in their curriculum? How many people are providing examples of, uh, of African American or any other type of diverse farmers? Folks mm -hmm. are doing that, so we gotta have this conversation. So to me, it's, it's the first step, is having this conversation about these type of things, these type of things. Go for it, so, so, so then let's transition to that. Uh, to that um, aspect of the, we've talked about what the heck has problemed, how all of these systemic issues, uh, how do we, how do we move the needle the other way? So first I think, you know, uh, again, to me, I would say is having conversations about race and racism. I think a lot of times, I think Ibram Kendi says this in his book, you know, I think the last, the last slide you have, it talks about it's not enough to be quietly non-racist. Now is the time to be vocally anti-racist. So I think it's important to understand uh, the difference between racist, not non-racist and anti-racist. So a lot of times people will say, hey, I'm not racist, but, but actually when you say you're not racist, you're not, you're not really stepping out against racism. Mm. So to me, when you say you're anti-racist, it means that you know, you're, looking, you're locating the roots of the problem and power and policies, which is what we talked about previously. But also, you're supporting people, right? You're supporting people and you're sending the message. So I think it's important to be not right, to be anti-racist and not just be not racist. So first, that's the first step. And then also, I think it's, it's important for folks to educate themselves about racism and structural racism in agriculture and what can we do. And then also, I think it's important of donating and supporting organizations that focus on diversity and ag. And one in particular I can think about that was founded on Michigan State's campus is, is called Manners, which is Minorities in Agriculture and Natural Resources and Related Sciences. And I served in, uh, as national president of that organization in 2015 and 16. And also now currently I serve as a national advisory board chair. So they have a junior Manners piece that focuses on outreach to middle school and high school. So I think that that's another avenue. And then also I think you can, block, you can buy food from black farmers and black owned food businesses, support them in that aspect. And then also, you can vote for lawmakers who are committed to food justice and advocate for policies that keep black farmers on their land, as well as policies that promote equity and the food access and health by addressing the legacy of racial, ethnic, and class inequality. So to me, those are different things that we can do. And then, you know, again, continue to recruit from our standpoint, recruit, retain, and develop those from underrepresented backgrounds. I, I, want, to, I want to believe, man. <laughs> Uh, I, I think one issue is uh, like related to this quote right here. It's not enough to be quietly non-racist. Uh, now it's time to be vocally anti-racist. Uh, relates to the to your terminology above, right? Where where I'm sure throughout this conversation I've been using these terms incorrectly to mean uh, saying the words racism when when what I'm talking about is discrimination versus prejudice, right? Uh, and so I just think when people are saying this thing, uh, I'm non-racist or I'm anti-racist, oftentimes we can take the easy right way out and say, and mean prejudice, right? I'm not prejudiced. And I'm in fact, it's prejudice. Is that the right word? Prejudice, whatever the right word is, uh, where the, that's a hugely critical issue, but there also is this bigger looming issue, which is this systemic problem uh, within our food system, within our society. And so I totally get that this, this visiting uh, or, or supporting black farmers, black businesses is a good thing. Um, and, it, and it cures some of this discrimination and prejudice, but at the same time, I worry that it doesn't solve the bigger issue of the, the systemic issue. 
And I think, you know, Alex, that's why I said, you know, important for, you know, to support lawmakers, you know, support folks that understand these systemic issues, right? And I think also it's important to have uh, representation and leadership roles, you know, whether it be in our agribusinesses, whether it be in our associations, you know, uh, and I think it's not, it's important not only to bring those folks to the table, but to have their voice amplified, right? So to me, it's to hear this and have these conversations, because I think, you know, we talk about systemic racism and the power of systemic racism or racism in general is the inability to name it and to speak it. I mean, just think about even in our initial conversations, you know, how uncomfortable it was to even talk about race and racism, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I said I started my conversation off as like, I don't normally get to talk about racism in agriculture. You know, because a lot of times when we talk about it, you know, uh, you know, it's the term that Robin D'Angelo coined is white fragility. So people either want to stop it or they feel uncomfortable or they get argumentative about it or they back away from it. You know, and, and I'm a person that I grew up in all different types of background, you know, uh, you know, give you a little bit more history. You know, uh, I was a little league baseball all star champion. Had a, you know, so I played baseball I was the only one on my baseball team. Right. So in 4-H and all these different organizations. So in basketball all across the board. So I understand, you know, uh, a lot of times if you want to maintain that, that equilibrium, you not talk about race. But as you can see, the incidents that's happened over the course of the two weeks over this country, uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't believe the amount of emails and texts that I've received, you know, uh, from my can white counterparts, my white friends, you know, uh, that I grew up with, uh, that even I haven't even talked to in 10 plus years, just asking questions and have that curiosity, you know, and everybody wants solutions. And I also say too, is that, you know, I'm not the only person that you can come to solutions. Uh, Google's a powerful tool as well. <laughs> I believe that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, to what extent have you been just like, leave me alone? I know you've been, I, I see your, your face on every email these days or every Twitter thing about this conversation, as, or this conversation about racism, this conversation about racism. I bet at this point you are exhausted, he, man. He even, I mean, he, he asked me to Google it yesterday. So it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so it's, it's all of us, but um, the. But I do um, appreciate you all asking. I do appreciate, appreciate you coming to the table and talking about this and asking, you know, if you know me, I got a little humor to myself, just like you all do. So I like having yeah. fun with it. So. Well, yeah. So, so for me, growing up, um, I, I I grew up in a fairly small town, um, and I never I always thought, well, the answer is I don't see color, right? Like that's that's what they try, and so like you just try to pretend the racism or there's no, race doesn't exist. It, we don't talk no about it. Yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to talk um, about it. And if if somebody brings up, well, I, I just I'm not a racist. I don't even see color. Which so it wasn't until um, so when I was an undergraduate at Rockhurst. Um, and I lived, I lived in like middle of Kansas city. Um, I was working on this, uh, this project where we did a, like a, we curated an exhibit for Eisenhower in the civil rights era. And, uh, so we went to the Eisenhower arch archives in Abilene, Kansas, which is the middle of nowhere sticks, Abilene, Kansas, great little town. It at least has a Sonic, but, uh, um, <laughs> they, uh, they, they have everything that was ever sent to the president, the, the pre president Eisenhower during his administration, any letter to the president that some random person wrote, they sent it to him. And I read every single thing that was sent to the Eisenhower presidency on race um, over his eight years. You in did? I did. Yeah. Every single thing. And so that was during the Little Rock exhibit uh, or the, the Little Rock incident. Um, you had uh, uh, Brown versus Board, which was a really big deal, obviously. Um, I mean, and, and I read literally every single letter that came in. It took me days um, to read this stuff. And, and what was shocking to me at the time was like Eisenhower is like a part of Kansas history. Like he's, you know, this rock star in, in my mind. And it wasn't that long ago, you know. So to me, I was like, well, Eisenhower, you know, he just died. He didn't die that long ago. You know, it's, it's still a part of the zeitgeist. I did not realize, A, it's one thing to be a racist or like to, to have this prejudice in your head. It's a whole other thing to feel like you need to send a letter to the president expressing your prejudice. Um, and it blew my mind to think that there were so many of these people that were still alive. Um, you know, I, I had their addresses, I had their names. And I actually, I, there was a while that I wanted to make a documentary where I was just going to go find these people and be like, you wrote this to the president in, uh, in the Eisenhower era. Uh, what do you think now? Um, but but that was, it wasn't until that moment when I was like 22 years old um, that I actually realized that, that race was still absolutely critical and top of mind for so many people in the United States. 
Um, it also happened when Obama was elected. That was about the same time. So, so that obviously like brought up a lot of this tension. Um, but but it, it, I look back at it and I think like, wow, it is crazy that I, I grew up to, you know, 21, 22 years old, never really thought that was that big a deal. Um, and it's, it's, you know, looking back at it, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed about it. Um, and I, so, you know, I try, I try to think with these students, how, how do you try to connect with students to, to let them know that this is a big deal? You know, what, what conversation, you said bring up George Washington Carver, start talking about, you know, um, people of color who have contributed to agriculture. What other ways, like, what, what do we need to be doing? So first, uh, what I also would say is, too, is that, you know, a lot of our, our go-to phrases is, is that I don't see color, right? Or I'm colorblind, right? And I, and I think there was a period of time where that, when that was the answer, right? Or the response when people say that. But now, if you say that to me, that's not sure that you support other people. You don't see their identity. You don't see their, what they go through their, or you don't acknowledge their experiences as a mm. color or a person, you know, regardless of whether they're gender or whatever, you know, gender identity, gender expression, you don't acknowledge that. So to me, I would recommend first for our listeners to never say again that you don't see color because mm. when you say you don't see color, you're not acknowledging their existence. So you're not acknowledging my existence as a person of color, as an African-American man. A uh, second, I think is, is that to me, you know, uh, I, I, and I listed this before is that I have a couple of key points I always say. So first, you know, regardless of what's going on in society, you know, seek to understand and not criticize. I always say that. So a lot of times we lead a discussion and saying, well, so-and-so shouldn't have did this, or they shouldn't have did this. Seek to understand and ask the question, why? Why do, you, why do you, you know, ask yourself internally and even ask other people that? So first, seek to understand and not criticize. Second, I always say is that you got to get comfortable having these conversations. So my go-to phrase is you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because we know when we talk about race and racism, it's definitely an uncomfortable topic. Right, but you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And last but certainly not least, you know, uh, again, create that space. You know, I try to do this in my role: is create a space where people can ask questions and without the fear of being judged. So I think you know that's one of the, the greatest takeaways. You know, and, and a lot of the ag programs I've been a part of is, uh, you know, it's particularly I think about the Kentucky Ag Leadership Program. The best time was they they paired us up each night, right? Three nights we paired us up. I had a different classmate and. We would sit up from 10 o'clock at night, the end of the sessions, to like two or three in the morning, just talking and having conversations. And those are some of the best conversations, you know, because I never, you know, I never had that opportunity to do that. So the ability to create genuine relationships across difference are important. And then also, I would always say is, you know, leave with a good space, but leave with a good place and you know, leave with a good space. Because if people know you're coming from a good place, they're not going to be critical or, or respond in a negative way, too. So that's how you support those students, those people that you interact with, Trey and Alex. Yeah, that's. I appreciate. It. I mean, so I, honestly, I, I've been reading a ton in the last few weeks. Um, you know, I just finished this book here, um, and uh, you know, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how to how to best engage in this space, and it's it's it is terrifying. Um, you know, it is it is scary to to try to step into a space that I honestly have no business even stepping into, but I. Like, I mean, like you said, it's, it's, you have to, right? Like, I, and, and so trying to find the right way to do it is, um, it's, it's an open-ended question for me right now. And so I, I really appreciate your kind of guidance on that. Right, right. Can I, that, I was going to say now that you and I and, uh, have, you know, worked on this together, I think the, the opportunities are endless, you know, and to me, it's like, I know where your all's office is located now. So, you know, after we get back to being on campus, you know, I'm going to check in with you all, and we're going to continue to have this dialogue and grow together. Yeah, that'd be great. Can I ask you, just like an honest perspective, you got these, you got Trey reading some books, and you got all your white buddies from 10 years ago who are emailing you and asking you what racism is. Um, I just want to know, are you, are you, are you hopeful that, that this is a moment of change or do you think that this is uh, 1968 again, where essentially we end up in the same place we were yeah, so I was, years and years ago? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So first, uh, my buddies, 10 years ago, wasn't calling me asking about racism. They were calling to offer their support. You know, say, I understand that, you know, the trauma that you may experience over your life, over your, over your life, you know, your life or whatever. And then also just to, just to re reinforce the, the, the important message that Quentin, uh, I value you as a friend, as an individual. You know, I think to me that that was really you know important to me to hear folks say that. 
you know, hear colleagues say that. And that's why I always say that, you know, I'm, I'm going to brag about my institution. That's why I appreciate being here at Michigan State because, you know, uh, in the college, because I got so many messages from colleagues and those that I work with that said that. And so you asked me, uh, do I have hope? So I would say that I wouldn't even be in this job or this role if I didn't have hope from the mm -hmm. So I think sometimes, you know, what, what we're seeing across the country uh, is because of, you know, social media, because of cameras. But to me, I've always knew that those things happen. And I always experienced small microaggressions that's happened to me over the course of my life, too. So to me, that doesn't change anything. To me, I've always been hopeful and optimistic. And I think if you're in a diversity, equity, inclusion business, and I say this, it's all about the people. And I say it's learning people, understanding people, and working and developing and supporting people. So that's why I say I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic. And even with you all reaching out to me, you know, we've been, uh, I've seen each other in passing, but you had something that motivated you to reach out to me and want to have this, have this conversation. And the four or five conversations that we've had, have been, you know, it's been really great. Trey, you've got, you've got, should we just end it there? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think that, that, let's yeah, it is four o'clock. But I mean, really, I honestly, this is a this is something that I, um, you know, you go get a PhD and you don't really. I mean, you try to publish, 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 and you get the grants, and then you teach the classes, and then you're doing all the things, and you're giving the extension talks, and then you're over here, and then you're doing this, and like, like, you know, I I, I really appreciate that Michigan State University has created this platform um, to to be able to have these conversations. Um, you know, it's, it's something that honestly they don't train you for in your PhD and maybe they should. Um, and, uh, so I, I, you know, I appreciate any, any guidance that you can give us and, you know, any time that we can help out with, with anything on this, like, please let us know. Um, you know, thanks, thanks again for joining us. This, this was very helpful, I think. And Alex and Trey, I thank you for this. And also for those listeners out there, whether you're internal or external to CNR, you know, to me, we're all in this together. And uh, again, our office is a resource. So again, thank you all for, for inviting me. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, so next week, we're going to talk about dairy bankruptcies. So <laughs> we're just going to keep going through happy talks. Um, but, uh, um, but thank you guys very much for talking this through. Quentin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you on campus whenever that can legally happen again. Uh, and, uh, you know, we definitely owe you for coming on. Thanks. See you guys.